OK, someone just confirmed you can see that. All right. Yeah, can see it. Yep. Yes. Right. So um, so my name is Laura Flower. I run Merritt's uh, garden employee garden program in South Jordan. We've been doing that since 2016, so we're just about ready to go into our uh, eighth growing season this year, which is hard to believe. Um, and uh, you know, we we've learned a lot along the way, um, and grown in a lot of different kind of uh, scenarios with every kind of weather you can imagine, really. And so I hope that the information I share here, as a result of my experience at Merit, as well as the last. 12 years of urban farming can be of some help for you. Um, so if you have questions along the way as we're going, um, mainly clarifying questions. So if you're not sure what I've said or you just want me to kind of explain a little bit more, I'm happy to do that. But we'll also have time at the end. I'll stay on for you know up to half an hour at the end if you have questions um, and you want to talk about something a little bit more. So feel free to, to do that. So I'm going to start with a slide that should um, convey my compassion <laughs> for all of the growing environments um, that we start out with on our gardening paths or our career paths in gardening. So this is a picture of uh, what we refer to as the farm space at Merit. So it's an additional quarter acre. So in addition to the garden boxes that we have, we have this extra quarter acre and this is the soil that we started out with okay i remember trying to till this soil um, with a really heavy duty rear tine tiller and it bounced off of the soil because it was so compacted and so full of clay okay you can see that the watering lines are um you know the the water has saturated really unevenly because of that that soil um compaction and so I feel you. I know what it's like to kind of start from ground zero if that's where you're at right now. But I want to start this conversation because uh, in a way that looks at gardening kind of as an accumulation of effort over time. Um, so it's a sort of a combination of, you know, thoughtful input, time, and you know kind of your own observation really and that's kind of i think where the magic of gardening happens is just by simply observing what it is you're seeing and how what you're doing is making an impact on the space that you're growing in so this is a picture from 2017 and you can see we've started doing not just pumpkins which is what that area was originally uh, we started uh, building the soil up with some um, compost, which if you don't know what that is, we'll talk more about it. But you can see that the beds have raised up where we had maybe some cucumbers and some tomatoes. And uh, we've put in some uh, wood chips in the pathways and things like that. OK, so looking a little bit less sad than in 2016. Well, then fast forward to 2021 and all of that input and all of that effort that we've put forward, um, as you can see, has made a tremendous difference. Um, so not just growing, you know, our pumpkins, but we've started, you know, doing lots of different flowers and herbs and all sorts of different things that have come to make the Merritt Garden kind of its own little ecosystem. And I hope that that's what we can kind of explore a little bit today. So this might be, uh, this likely is a very new concept for a lot of folks, but I think it's very worth sharing. And we're gonna kind of thread some of these uh, concepts into this presentation today. So regenerative agriculture, okay, is a new term, but it's an ancient practice about essentially mimicking nature um, and how it kind of, um, when left to its own devices with some um, positive input from us as human beings, really um, performs um, and, and kind of creates its own balance. Um, and so it's based on, you know, basically a system that mimics nature, like I said, and, and lies on these five principles. Um, the first is minimizing soil disturbance. Um, so on that picture on the left, you can see there's a tiny little seedling, okay? It's maybe two or three inches tall. And below it, you can see sort of the darker colored um, actual roots of the plant. 
But what the majority of that structure is, is a beneficial fungus called mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae is incredible because basically it, it grows and um, adheres to the, to the roots of a plant, and then it extends itself out through the soil and is able to access nutrients and water, okay? And thereby supporting this plant. And then the, the plant brings down, you know, all of its, um, you know, nutrients and, uh, from photosynthesis and feeds the mycorrhizae. So there's a symbiosis, symbiotic kind of relationship happening. And every time we till, every time we churn up that soil, we kind of, we, we ruin that entire structure, right? So this just goes to tell you that underneath the soil, what we don't see is that, um, you know, nature is sort of doing its work. Um, there's billions of microorganisms in the soil that are creating these little hotels and structures that, um, that really are the foundation of what it is to have healthy plants growing out of that or out of that medium. Okay, so minimizing soil disturbance, um, maintaining living roots in the in the soil, which we'll touch on later, keeping the soil covered. So that might be with something like leaf litter or uh, growing cover crops, which might sound like a crazy concept right now, and we'll touch on it later. Integrating animals. Which and I know unless you know you've got room for chickens uh, or you know cattle, that might not be an emphasis that we're really on today. Um, and planting diverse crops, so that's just basically plant, planting a diversity of whether it's herbs, vegetables, flowers. Um, so in combination, this is the this is the scenario in which you will have the greatest garden success. Whether you have one small garden box or you're gardening on your patio, or you've got a more sizable amount of space that you're working with, okay? If you wanna learn a little bit more about regenerative agriculture, there's a link there at the bottom of the page and um, its implications for large-scale farming in terms of climate change, um, global soil health is pretty incredible um, and I encourage you to take a look. So we're gonna step a couple step back, steps back, and talk about soil type. So soil type um, really comes down to the basic elements in which your soil was formed based on the geological history of where you're at. OK, the reason that this is important is because you might approach cultivating or starting your garden or contributing to your current garden very differently based on the type of soil that you have. So you can see there's that triangle up in the top uh, left hand corner, and this is regardless of where you live, right? This is just the elemental parts of what make up soil or dirt, right? So most of us in Utah can look right away at the picture of clay, um, right? There's clay, sand and silt. So clay, because uh, much of the Salt Lake uh, or Utah Valley was underwater under the Bonneville shoreline, uh, or bond of the lake for many, 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 many years, um, our clay tends to look like this, right? Clay in itself is not bad, but when it when your soil is in an extreme of clay, then it's very dense and water doesn't drain, right? Those types of kind of challenges. If you have really sandy soil, if you're living, you know, maybe somewhere, I don't know exactly what the soil is like in places like Texas, for example, but if you go to Southern Utah, you might find that the soil is a lot more sandy there. It drains really quickly, um, but it doesn't hold on to nutrients, right? And if you picked up soil, you could feel its grittiness, right? Silt, I almost liken to like a river bottom. And um, it's very fine and kind of um, almost clay-like, but it breaks apart easier. So the reason this is important is, you know, if you have your garden outside and you could just pick up a handful of soil, like what do you see in there? Do you feel clots? of what feel like you could roll a ball into clay? Does it fall apart in your hand? Um, you know, what is it doing? Um, and like I said, being an observer of your space is probably the most powerful, one of the most powerful things that you can kind of uh, cultivate as a new gardener or an experienced gardener. So we really want kind of what's in the middle of this circle here uh, or in the middle of this triangle, which is a loam. We want something that kind of has the best of all worlds. Um, and the main way that we can change our soil type 
or improve upon that soil type is to add compost. OK, so um, compost contributes to that nice loamy soil. What we think of when we you know, visualize the most gorgeous garden in the world, um, we pick it up and it has, you know, maybe bits of wood chips and, you know, it feels nice in the hand. Um, the compost is a really, um, or organic matter, which is sort of an interchangeable um, uh, um, definition, or not definition, but um, reference to what I'm talking about. So compost is the you know, not only changes your soil type, but it's the biological life force that fuels your soil and all of that, those amazing microorganisms that we're talking about in the first couple slides, right? So it can include a lot of different organically derived materials. By that, I mean shredded aged wood chips. It can have leaf litter, composted manure, worm castings, kelp, bat guano, right? Be all sorts of different things. Um, I always recommend um, if you want to incorporate this uh, in your garden to get an organic compost. And the reason for that is that a lot of um, like uh, what's the most popular. Uh, oh, goodness, the one that everybody uses tur oh, no, it's not turbo my garden. Miracle Miracle Grow Miracle Grow. It generally has fertilizer um, pellets mixed into it, and that to me is not a preferred way to fertilize because you don't really know what you're putting down. And if that sounds confusing right now, we'll clarify it in another um, in another slide. But getting an organic compost that's just really made up of those elemental pieces um, is highly recommended. Um, so you can get a small bag uh, if you have a small garden or you can get larger size um, shipments to your home. Um, you can there's lots of places to do bulk orders uh, where you can go pick it up with a truck or a trailer and it all depends on how big your garden is. So it's generally recommended to add in about two inches of um, compost or organic matter every season into your garden. So if you had a four by four garden, you'd just be putting a two inch layer over that entire space and you know you can incorporate it in. You can also leave it on top and over time that organic matter kind of gets down into the soil. OK, if you're starting a new garden box like a raised box, you'd want to put in about 30 to 50 percent of compost um, and the other percentage would be of topsoil, which is basically just a quality, um, a quality soil, right? If you ever look around and you see advertisement or an option for fill dirt, don't ever get that. You want to get a topsoil to mix in with that compost, okay? Um, you want to add in compost in the fall, ideally, but you can also add it in in the springtime, you know, um, when the ground starts to thaw, which in Utah is around uh, March, okay? And then you want to always uh, avoid amending your soil and by amending I mean like turning it or flipping it over um, when it's really wet. OK, if you take your shovel in the soil and you flip it over and you just kind of have this clot, just pause, walk away and come back um, when the soil's dried out a little bit. And the reason for that is that amending when um, when the soil is really wet is that it can really degrade the structure of your soil. You can be left with these you know, concrete um, blocks that take forever to break down and it just becomes a pain. So that's a, a pro tip for you. OK, so maybe you're thinking about putting in raised beds or in ground beds, um, or maybe you already have and this slide should be helpful regardless of that situation for you. So if you want to do a raised bed, there are some pros to doing that, right? Um, especially in speaking of soil, because we have there's a lot more control over the soil, your soil texture and the makeup of your soil. So if you're in an area that has notoriously poor soil, it's really rocky or it's a big hard pan of clay, then you might want to consider um, putting in a raised garden box because it kind of gets you off to a better start. Um, uh, there's less bending, right? It does have a more tidy appearance. Um, so if you were wanting to do a garden in your front yard, for example, a raised box might be a nice option because it just looks a little bit more um, put together and, and well organized than in ground beds. 
Um, it does have better drainage um, or it can have much better drainage. There are some cons, of course, um, because the uh, the garden is sort of lifted up off the ground. There's a lot less insulation or kind of connectivity with the surrounding um, soil environment. So there's bigger fluctuations in water and temperature. So um, there's ways to minimize that through what's called mulching, which we'll talk about in another slide. Um, there's more upfront costs, right? You have to put time and effort into making it. It does weather and break down over time. Um, it requires a lighter textured soil to prevent compaction. So you'd want to, you know, do that 30 to 50% compost, and then you'd want to do a topsoil mix that maybe is, um, you know, formulated for raised beds. And oftentimes times it's advertised that way, okay? So some of the pros and cons of in-ground beds, um, you utilize existing soil, so it is a lot cheaper. You're, there's a lot less initial sort of input to make a garden happen. Um, it retains moisture and is more consistent um, with regulating temperature because it's, again, part of a larger soil environment that um, doesn't fluctuate as greatly. Um, it allows you to expand your garden with a lot less effort, right? You just have to start digging and, and removing some grass and then, you know, add a little compost and presto, you have a new a, a new growing space. Um, it's less expensive, um, but it does take um, more effort to improve your soil if you're starting from a really rough place. Certainly not um, impossible by any means, but might need a little bit more um, tender love and care to, to build that soil to a nice place that we have spoken about earlier. Um, you have to maintain your borders and manage weeds um, a little bit more closely because you don't have that hard line of the, of the wood to sort of keep things um, well separated. Um, and it is less ideal if you don't like bending or crouching um, or if that's difficult for you. So some pro tips on for either scenario, okay, is um, for an in-ground bed, you want to make sure you thoroughly remove sod, so your grass and any kind of weeds before you do anything. Um, there's some ways you can do that simply by putting, you know, compost and cardboard down in the fall, for example, and letting that sit and then coming back to it the following year um, with, for being nice and ready to cultivate. Um, and you want it to be no wider than about four inches deep or four inches wide. So that just speaks to, you know, how difficult it is to reach the middle of that bed from either side. Um, <clears throat> some pro tips on the side of, um, uh, raised garden boxes is that again you want to make sure you remove sod and weeds really thoroughly. Um, you never want to line the inside of a raised garden box with any kind of plastic or impermeable material um, that prevents water from uh, draining out of uh, draining from the soil. Okay, it can cause all sorts of problems. Uh, and you also want to uh, never use treated wood for your, uh, in the construction of your actual boxes, okay? Um, whatever they use to, to treat that lumber can leach into the soil and then it can leach into your food and obviously then into your body. So always use untreated wood. You wanna put some thought into how you construct these boxes so that they hold up over time because they will, you know, uh, weather and break. And so the more you can do to reinforce, like putting in four by four posts where there are corners or at the, midpoint of your box can really help um, always using screws and never nails and then putting in um, on the on the corner some type of metal material or metal corners that can keep the integrity of the box uh, going and again I generally say no wider than about four feet okay and length really doesn't matter it just depends on you know what the setup of your of your yard is okay so speaking of one of the most fundamental um, kind of contributors to success or, or failure of a garden is the amount of sun that you have, right? So all I want you to take away from this slide is that anything that fruits, okay, which means anything that has a seed inside of it, tomato, which by the way, tomato is a fruit. Hope your minds are all blown right now. I know it's wild. 
but tomatoes, peppers, melons, anything where you're getting an actual fruit off the plant needs at least six, but ideally eight plus hours of sunlight a day, okay? So if you have an existing garden and it's always been kind of shaded, that might be a, a large culprit as to why you are not getting a very good harvest to why your plants aren't doing well, okay? If you have a shaded area and still want to garden, then lots of um, anything with a that where you're eating the leaf of the plant, those can tolerate a lot less sun or thrive with a lot less sun. So that would be um, even green beans will do fairly well, but lettuces, kale, Swiss chard, rhubarb, mustard, and herbs like basil and cilantro and those types of things will do uh, quite well, especially in the peak heat of the summer. Um, when it's very hot and those things tend to suffer. Um, so there's a, a little tip for you there. All right, so sun and temperature. It's my favorite garden slide. I don't know why, but you know, you'll just have to tolerate it. Um, so when we, and as you know, temperatures and weather get more and more extreme as we see year after year, you know, sun and heat are a big part of that in, in um, particularly in Utah, but a lot in a lot of sunny states as well that tend to be hot in the summer months. So watering and watering wisely um, is one of the most helpful things that you can do um, to have garden success. I think a lot of us look out at our gardens in, you know, July and we think I'm hot and I'm thirsty, so I must need to go out there and just water every single day, right? When in reality, that might actually be one of the worst things that you can do for your garden. Because the number one reason that plants die or don't succeed is too much water, right? We kind of love our plants to death. It's like, we're always kind of like looking at it over in the corner, like, do you need something? Do you need me to touch you? Do you need some water? Do you need some, you know? And sometimes that overattention can cause things to to not go the way that we would like it to. So when we overwater um, and there's not oxygen in the soil because it's constantly sort of filled up with water, plant roots can die, right? Because they need oxygen in order to live. Um, it can cause issues like root rot, um, fungal issues, algae buildup, things like that, that really degrade the life and the health of a plant. So a better way to think about watering is to water deeply and less frequently, okay? That doesn't mean watering really deeply and then letting it go, get bone dry. Those extremes are are not beneficial, but letting your garden just um, with the garden soil just dry out slightly before the next irrigation um, is really helpful. So in that top left picture, you can see that there is a little clot of soil. This is a really good kind of eye test to know if your garden has enough uh, water or the soil is, is watered well enough. So if you dig your finger down in the soil a couple inches and pick up a, a sort of a clot of dirt and you squeeze it and it stays in place almost like an awesome, you know, little like mud ball, that means that the, wa that the soil is at capacity with how much water it can hold at that time. So if you picked it up and that's what happened, then you, there's no need to water, okay? So you might do that and then come out another day or two later and do the same thing. And if that crumbles in your hand, if it's not holding together, or if it's not even holding a ball, then that would be a great time to irrigate, okay? And you can get in a rhythm and see how frequently that cycle's happening. Okay, it's in a ball, then two days later, that seems to be a good time to water. And you can start to really pay attention to, um, you know, how often you need to be watering, okay? Um, always water in the morning or the evening, okay? Um, and not during the hottest part of the day. And if you're watering by hand, we wanna always avoid watering the actual leaves themselves. I think there's something psychological about seeing your plants wet. Maybe it makes us feel like they cool down from the heat or they're getting the water. But when we do that, we're actually encouraging more um, bacterial issues um, uh, and other kind of challenges. So we want to always water at the base of the plant where the roots are, right? And you might go around with the hose multiple times and you're just trying to imagine letting that water infiltrate the soil as thoroughly as you can, okay? Um, 
so there, I hope that kind of summarizes the the main, uh, you know, main tactics you can use to to better be a, a observer of of watering um, practices for your garden. So. In Utah, in a lot of places that tend to be really dry um, and don't have a lot of annual um, precipitation like Utah or um, I'm not exactly sure how Texas is. I know Texas is hot, humid, <laughs> but you'll have to tell me on that one. Um, so in Utah, it's highly recommended to use a drip irrigation system. Again, unless you have great annual rainfall where you are gardening, okay? So these are some different um, types of irrigation out there. I've tried all of these and um, and these are this is my personal opinion um, based on that experience. So after a lot of different experimenting, I really like a product that's called Netafin. I don't work for Netafin. I'm not endorsing them, but it is a trademarked um, uh, product that I found to be very durable, um, easy to repair. It lasts a long time. It's very versatile. Um, it has couplers and uh, by couplers, I mean where your hoses connect that are in the shape of like a T or a cross or a T. If you get a hole, you can cut it out and, and, and put it back together really easily. Um, it is a bit more expensive. Um, than say like a drip tape or something like that but i think it's a it's a multi-year investment and it can be used in a garden environment a landscape project like for your front yard something like that um i have used drip tape before which is that second item down um it's much more flexible it's cheaper it comes in a big roll um it does tend to be a bit leaky it's difficult to repair because it's very uh, very thin type of plastic um, it's hard to set aside or move around um, a bit when you um, want to remove irrigation from a garden area temporarily. Um, and if you don't have the infrastructure in your yard or garden to um, put in a drip system, because generally you need the, the um, structures underground that uh you know prevent water from uh, backflowing into your system and and um basically all the infrastructure that allows you to do a drip um a drip system if you don't have uh capability to do that right now then pvc is a great option because you can hook it right up to a hose and um it's not the prettiest thing in the world but it is cheap and it's durable and it's very versatile in how you can use it. Um, and essentially what you would be doing would be to lay, um, create a frame that sits inside the garden box and on the end, your hose can connect directly to it. And then, then along that PVC line, you're drilling holes where the water can kind of seep out. And that means that you're not out there again in July hand watering. Um, a couple items that I would not recommend for a gardening or at least vegetable gardening. One would be a soaker hose. So unlike these other products, a soaker hose is essentially a permeable tube where the water kind of seeps out of, in, of every kind of pore of this tube. But if that breaks, you get one nick or break on that, the whole um, length of the hose has to be replaced because there's no uh no good way to uh, repair repair it um spaghetti tubing or when you have like a blank plastic line and small emitters coming out for a vegetable garden environment i would not recommend that because you want your garden to be versatile over um many years right you might change what goes in what what spot or how big your garden is and so this spaghetti tubing method isn't quite as versatile however if you're doing a landscaping project like in your front yard where you are doing perennial uh, plants meaning that they come back every single year then this is a fantastic system um, to minimize your water usage and make the water go exactly where you want it to okay but if it's more of an annual flower or vegetable garden i would recommend using something a little bit more versatile than this okay 
So once we've laid down our water, and because water is so precious, we want to make sure that it stays in the soil. And the main way that we do that we can do that is through mulching. So mulch is kind of any type of organic material that's laid on top of the soil and you're doing like two to four inches on top um, to uh, help retain the moisture that you've put down. It um, helps cool the soil and uh, which can be really helpful when you have big extremes of uh, uh, in a single day in terms of temperature and weather. And it also helps prevent weed seeds from coming up because you are um, you are restricting light to the surface soil, the soil of the surface of the soil. So there's some a lot of different products that out there you can use. Um, straw or um, horse hay can be a great option. I say to buy a compressed bale or horse hay because um, straw can have weed seeds in it. Um, and so you have to be a little careful where you buy it. Um, and so that's why horse hay, horse hay tends to be higher quality and has a lot fewer weed seeds in it. So that's a great option and that can last multiple seasons. Um, wood chips are what we use at Merritt's Community Garden. Um, it does a really great job, but the caveat to using that product or to using uh, wood chips is that you don't want to incorporate all those wood chips back into the soil. Basically, that's a tremendous amount of carbon to to add all at once into your garden soil. So you would want to rake that back, or you know, um, you know, just pull back the the wood chips where you're planning to plant your actual plant. If it's you wanting it to be there, all the the, the wood chips to sort of remain all the time. You can use products like coconut core. Um, and you can also use something as simple as shredded leaves. And I put an asterisk on shredded because uh, leaves can really retain an excess of moisture. Um, and so you want them to be kind of broken down or shredded down a bit. Um, you could do that simply by putting them out on your lawn and going over them with a mower so that they're a bit of a finer material. But that also works really well. Okay. So we're going to get into plant nutrition, okay? I think that this might be from the people, gardeners I've spoken to over the years, this might be where there is the most confusion about what you should do um, and what products are available out there to, to use for, um, for your plant nutrition. So basically, there are three main categories of, nu of nutrition that are important for plants to thrive, okay? There are macronutrients. Macronutrients are um, the elements that plants need in the greatest percentage, okay? They, they need it in, in the greatest amount. So every fertilizer bag or bottle that you see at the store or at the nursery always has three numbers on it, okay? You can see there on that example, blood meal, is a 12 zero zero okay those three numbers refer to nitrogen phosphorus potassium or npk okay so this blood meal for example is um has 12 uh, is 12 percent nitrogen zero percent phosphorus zero percent potassium and we'll talk about why this is actually one of my favorite products to use okay so those are the macronutrients that plants need to thrive and grow. They also need micronutrients, just like us, right? Vitamins and minerals and all these smaller um, but very important elements that we need to function properly in our body. Well, plants are the same way. So just like us, things like zinc and iron and copper and magnesium and manganese and sulfur and many other items. Plants need this in a much smaller amount, but if they're really depleted, then they can have just as big a consequence um, in terms of limiting plant growth as those macronutrients that we're talking about, okay? In general, and this is very area specific, um, but generally speaking, at least for Utah, there are micronutrients, uh, plenty of micronutrients in the soil 
um, with the exception of iron. Iron tends uh, to be a bit low depending on your area, but you can get a product called chelated iron um, that helps supplement that deficiency and is uh, and will turn the problem around. Um, and then the third part of plant nutrition, like we talked about, is that microorganism health or the biology of our soil equally is important. So we get that from compost slash organic matter and by some of those regenerative gardening methods that we talked about. That's what keeps that, you know, those billions of organisms um, thriving and um, benefiting our plants. OK. Um, so on the right hand side here, you'll see some examples of different organically derived um, products that have those macronutrients in them. OK. Um, so I'm not going to go over that too much, but when I say organic, I don't mean USDA organic stamp. I just mean a product that's come from an organic um, source, right? It's coming from an animal. It's coming from a plant. It's coming from some type of uh, natural extract. Um, and so if you want a complete list of organically derived fertilizers, then you can click that link there uh, later on and access that information. Okay. Is everybody okay? Is this nerding out too hard or are we still all right? I'm just going to assume everybody is just feeling amazing. Okay. You're doing great. <laughs> Moving on. So again, I'm not going to sit here on this slide too long. Oops, pardon me. But um, this tells you what those macronutrients, the big three or NPK that we just talked about, this is what those macronutrients do for your plant. OK, so nitrogen is responsible for all the vegetative and leafy growth of the plant. Phosphorus helps with the roots and the seed and fruit development of your on your plant. And potassium kind of helps with the plant's immune system and its ability to regulate heat and cold. OK, um, there's also a small explanation there on each of those about what a deficiency looks like, which is kind of hard to um, to really confirm with with the naked eye. OK, um, but the reason that this is important is that nitrogen, OK, that blood meal that we're talking about, Nitrogen is water soluble, so that means every time it rains, every time we irrigate or we go through this all these winter months with snow coming down, those nitrogen levels are are coming down, down, down because of that um, irrigating or water. And so in general, this is really important. Asterisk, listen up, is that we generally need to add nitrogen to our gardens every single year because it gets flushed out, OK? I'm going to give you our kind of garden pro tip in the next couple slides on what we do to in integrate um, nitrogen into our gardens every year and the products that we use with great success to do that. Now, phosphorus and potassium, they are not water soluble, which means they stick around in the soil a lot longer. Um, so you can actually get a buildup of those nutrients in the soil. So if you put down a 12, 12, 12, for example, every single year for 10 years, you could have serious problems with phosphorus, phosphorus or potassium because they don't flush out of the soil like nitrogen does. OK, so I know that's a lot, but I think the takeaway hopefully was there. So how do you know what you have in your soil to begin with? What, what's the baseline? Well, the only way you're actually going to know is to get a soil test, OK? Every state has like an extension office, so that's your local resource for gardening and farming um, information. Um, so and they should be able to either provide or, uh, or refer you to a place where you can get your soil tested. And even if you only test your soil one time in your entire gardening career or for that particular garden, it is well worth your while, OK? It will tell you some really crucial things, such as the pH of your soil, OK? So this is an actual soil, uh, soil results from a test maybe a couple years ago at Merritt Garden. 
um, it'll tell you the pH. So if you had extraordinarily high pH, your plants aren't going to grow no matter what you do to your soil. So that would be a really helpful thing to know, right? Salinity or the levels of salt in your soil, again, for whatever reason, based on where you are, if you had very high salt, um, then no matter else what you, uh, no matter any other input you tried to, um, tried to sort of alter, that salt would always be an issue. But it, uh, soil tests will tell you your phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen, just like we talked about. OK, and it'll tell you your um, you can opt to have it tell you your micronutrient um, levels as well. That zinc, iron, copper, and it'll tell you, do you need something else or is it adequate? Is it high? Right. So that um, again will give you a baseline on everything you need to know. Otherwise. If you have a garden that just has never done well and you tried all these different tactics and it still just isn't doing well, you might try a million different things, but unless you have a soil test, it's kind of like trying to hit a target with a blindfold on, right? Because you don't know what the issue actually is, okay? So a, a, a test, soil test could be anywhere from, you know, 40 to $100, but again, worth it if you're planning on having a garden for the long term in particular. So real quick, we're going to talk about nitrogen, because again, if we need to add nitrogen every single year, um, our soil test, and this is, a, this is a good rule of thumb, generally speaking, for what you could add into your garden every single year. So two to four pounds nitrogen per thousand square feet, okay? Brace yourself or turn your brain off if you're like, this is too much and, you know, that's okay. But if you want to nerd out with me, come along for the ride. Okay, so if we want to put down two to four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. There's a really simple um, calculation that, or uh, formula that you can use to figure out how much fertilizer you need to put down, okay? So that top uh, section is the equation. X pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet times um, one pound fertilizer divided by um, the percentage or concentration of the fertilizer multiplied by your the size of your particular garden. So this is where it might make sense. So if you, if, you know, we got that soil test back and it said two to four pounds per thousand square feet. And I'd said, okay, I'm gonna shoot for two pounds of nitrogen, okay? Well, that's what's on that, the top side of that um, equation in red, okay? And that goes over a thousand square feet. That stays fixed. And then we multiply that by one pound fertilizer, that stays constant, it doesn't change. But what you put in is the percent of fertilizer that you're putting on. So that blood meal is a 12, is 12, 12, zero, zero, which means 12% nitrogen. So that's why in red, it says 0.12, okay? And then we multiply that by the size of our garden area, okay? And then you can see how that fi figures at the bottom there. And so what I find from that is that I need to put down 1.6 pounds or about one and a half pounds of uh, blood meal per 100 square feet because that's how big my garden is, okay? So again, if you want help walking through that, you're not sure, there's probably also plenty of engineers who are like, sister, you must think life's real hard because that's not hard. I know we have every type of person on this call in terms of how our brains work and and how this goes. So if you want more information or you want me to walk you through it, feel free to reach out. Okay, so here's our pro tip on what we do at Merritt Garden that works really well for us, okay? So in the spring, we incorporate in blood meal, which is a granular um, product. And just like it sounds, if you're wondering, okay, you've said blood meal, what is blood meal? It is dehydrated pig blood. So if you, um, don't want to use a product like that then there are other options there's feather meal which is ground chicken feathers it's all real fun and yes it all has just a slight tinge of earthy aroma uh, to it there are other types of products that aren't animal based out there 
but they tend not to be um, may they tend not to be uh, as high um, in their nutrient content. OK. So we incorporate blood meal into our garden boxes, into the soil in the spring. Um, at least two weeks before planting. So you spread that on the ground and you incorporate it in. You can, you know, rake it in. If you're turning your bed, you can do that. And so we prep our soil bed like that. And then two weeks after we've actually put our plants in the ground, we've planted our tomatoes and peppers and watermelons. We go around with a product called fish emulsion, which is fish guts, which also has a very distinguished aroma but you get used to it and it works wonders so you mix that in water like in a watering can and then you water in the base of the plants really well and you soak it through okay um and you would want to avoid watering in root crops okay because what does nitrogen do nitrogen is responsible for the green vegetative growth of the plant okay and that's generally again what's needed every single year. But if you fertilize your carrots with nitrogen, what's going to happen? I want to hear one answer. Come on. What's going to happen? OK, be, be shy. Be green. You get gorgeous carrot tops. If you want award winning carrot tops, then you put that nitrogen on there. But <laughs> avoid it if you're looking for a nice Parrot, which is a root, the root of that vegetable, right? Or the, a root vegetable. Um, so you want to do that two weeks after planting. And then pretty much that's all the nitrogen we need for the entire season. Unless I notice that a plant is like struggling, it's not really doing well, it's slow to grow, which could there could be other issues happening. I might supplement a little bit more fish emulsion, but other than that, that's usually all the nitrogen that we need for the entire season and our gardens do wonderfully well usually if mother nature doesn't you know give us the old hee-ho um so hopefully that's helpful for you guys and those are both very easy products to find um at a nursery you can buy them online there are organic if you want like organic um blood meal for example uh, that could easily be found online. <clears throat> OK, so we're get, getting towards the uh, end of the presentation, but we've got a few more tips to share. So I know that at least 10 percent of you guys out there in the springtime, when you start your garden, you put in maybe five times more plants and can fit in the garden space that you have, probably because you're excited, right? And you want to um, it, it seems like a good idea at the time, but giving plants the proper amount of space is one of the most powerful, th powerful things you can do to get a good crop and to get um, a lot off of your plants that you do grow. So on that left hand side, that's an example of um, one garden box out at Merritt at, at Merritt's garden. So it's five feet wide and it's 20 feet long. So we have a hundred square feet that we're working with, right? And when gardeners plan and select their crops that they want to grow in their garden box, this comes along in a handout. And this um, kind of helps them know how much how much space do different types of plants take up. Um, so a watermelon or a winter squash, for example, those get massive, right? We say at least 30 square feet. So if you want to plant one of those items, that's how much space one plant needs, right? If you want to grow an heirloom tomato, which are the ones that get really big, give that at least six square feet. Cucumbers, 15 square feet, okay? If you would like a copy of this worksheet that we give to our community garden uh, members, uh, I'm more than happy to send this to you and you might find it really helpful. OK, the other thing is choosing quality plants and plants that do well in your area. Um, I don't think you need to stress too much about that, because if you go to a, a reputable nursery, they tend to sell varieties that um, are meant to or um, are known to perform well in our area. OK, so getting your plants from a good place is probably one of the 
the best things that you can do. We also do a plant sale for those in South Jordan. So if you want to come get plants from us, um, you know, come do that. OK. So when do we plant our stuff? You could follow this, all of this, um, all these recommendations to a T, but if you plant your tomato when it's 40 or 30 degrees outside with no protection, you won't have any success, right? So knowing when your area um, has its spring, kind of summer and fall is very helpful, right? So for Utah, for example, spring is considered kind of March, April, and um, those items on the left-hand column are the things that we get started at that time of year, okay? So those are items that can tolerate um, cool temperatures, even uh, frosts, and some of them even thrive in that type of environment. The middle column is uh, are our favorite summer crops, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. We don't want to plant those until after the last um, frost of the year. So in Utah, that tends to be the second week of May, okay? And if you are a Utahn in this um, meeting here, don't be fooled by Mother's Day. That's kind of the benchmark that everybody uses, but every single year we've gotten cold um, or sort of disastrous type weather, I swear, right after Mother's Day. So at Merritt Garden, we usually wait till the third or even fourth week of May to get our plants in, and that's worked out uh, very well for us. Essentially, if you were getting ready to plant those summer items and you looked at the forecast and you saw that the nighttime low was going to be 38 degrees or 40 degrees, I would hold off because you want the temperatures to be no cool, colder than about 50 degrees, okay, for our summer loving crops, okay? That's the big asterisk takeaway on that. Um, and then fall season crops. Um, these items that can be planted in late summer and uh, for kind of a, a, a late summer or a, a kind of late fall harvest, okay? Uh, the items in blue can be succession planted, which means you can plant carrot seeds, for example, and then two weeks later, you can come back in um, in another nearby area and plant another row. And what that does is allows a continuous harvest of that crop because one carrot seed is one carrot. So interesting. Whoa, okay, moving on. So again, just to speak to, I realize that um, there's folks from all across the, the country here potentially today. And so knowing your hardiness zone is really important. This predicts, again, when you're, First frost is, or your, sorry, your last frost is. So that means, you know, we're in February here in Utah and we're expecting our last frost around the second week of May. And that's our green light to plant our summer vegetables. And it also tells us when our first frost is likely to be. So in the season, um, for us, that's middle of October. That's when the cold weather begins again and we go back in, into winter time, okay? So you can um, follow that link and get to the plant hardiness zone map. And you should also be, be able to reach out to your local extension um, office and ask those questions if you're unsure. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about bugs because there's a lot of misnomers around insects when we see them or when we you know, think that uh, you know, we see a bug and it means something is wrong. I want you all to remember that 90% of the insects in our gardens are actually beneficials, okay? Granted, the, the smaller percentage that can do damage can do a tremendous amount of damage. But I want you to kind of use, um, put your thinking cap on when you see a, a bug in your garden and try and identify, A, what it might be, um, and B, if you can see if it's, you know, is it uh, causing any damage? Is it causing a little bit of damage or is it causing a lot of damage, right? When you see something happening or you feel your garden being threatened, you may want to pull out the pesticide immediately because you're in protective mode, right? But take a pause and kind of look and see what's happening before you decide to to act on, on what to do. Um, 
if you need to if you need to control a pest that you are uh, that you have in your garden just make sure that you are applying that product mm -hmm. by following the label specifically and also avoiding um times of the day where pollinators are out or beneficials uh, particularly you know honeybees bumblebees those types of things because when you spray a pesticide you are also killing beneficials so it's not a um a very targeted experience essentially um one of the best things that you can do though to to suppress bad bugs and to increase beneficial bugs is to have healthy soil again we're kind of tagging that um, uh, uh, regenerative agriculture concept of planting diverse crops so if we have healthy soil if we do crop rotation meaning we don't plant the same thing in the same spot every single year if we plant a diversity of things not only vegetables but flowers and herbs those are some of the most powerful things that we can do to um, bring in beneficial so that if we do have pest problems, those will help to keep the keep those populations down. Um, so there's that for you. And yeah, I think that's about it. Fun fact on here, top left of this slide, okay, you'll see four items. You can see the ladybug or what most people would identify as a ladybug with the red um, shell and the black spots. But did you know that the uh, thing right above it is actually a juvenile ladybug, right? So if you see this crazy orange black looking, um, I was thinking of them as like a, an alligator or some type of prehistoric being, that's a, that's a ladybug. So don't squish them and uh, send them on his merry way or her. All right, diversity, like I just touched on in that last uh, slide. Rather than thinking about, you know, planting the same thing, I know that most people are attached to a certain crop, right? We love tomatoes, we love to make salsa, and that's all well and good, right? Enjoy that. But also think about incorporating flowers and herbs and different things into your garden, and that's going to um, create some of the biggest benefits to your garden space. Um, also, rotating crops. So if you tend to love to plant your tomatoes every uh, year in the same spot, switch it up if you can, because pest and disease build up where there's too much repetitive motion, right? Or repetitive um, habits, if that makes sense. All right, I think this is our last slide, but I just wanna kind of bring this back down to those five principles of regenerative agriculture, regenerative gardening, okay? So that traditional way that we tend to garden, um, unfortunately, kind of ends up discouraging biodiversity. So I know that a lot of us till, and I am not till, I'm not till shaming here, okay, at all. I think tilling can be very helpful when you're building your soil, um, when you're kind of trying to cultivate a new space. But if you're someone that tills every year, maybe think about doing it every other year. OK, um, you can also incorporate new tools into that soil amendment part of your garden season by using a product like uh, a broad fork. So the broad fork is the picture right below that um, tiller. So that is a large steel fork, essentially, that you stand on, that tines go on the ground, and then you just gently lift the soil. That's what we use out of the garden. Um, they can be a little bit expensive, um, but they last a lifetime. And um, if you didn't have something like that, even using a shovel and rather than turning the soil or totally pulverizing it in order to um, in order to keep those bacteria and fungi and all that work that your soil is doing uh, to keep it intact, even using a shovel and just gently lifting um, could could be a great thing to incorporate into your garden management system. And then the other idea is that in that traditional way of gardening is that at the end of the season, when we pull out our plants and we're putting everything to bed, rather than leaving bare soil, go toss on some, um, some 
uh, leaves, something like that, to keep the soil covered. Maybe that's one small thing that you can do. And I promise any one of these tactics will have wonderful benefits on your soil and on your productivity. Because when we take care and have healthy soil, this is what's mind blowing. When we have healthy soil, not only is gardening more seamless and that there's not as many you know, as much pest pressure, um, our plants are healthier. We actually have more nutrient dense food so that when you bite that tomato, there's more nutrients in it because the soil also is being taken care of, okay? That to me is pretty amazing and a huge motivator to want to incorporate some of these concepts. Um, if you want to uh, experiment with that maintaining living roots concept that we talked about, you can experiment with what are called cover crops, okay? And cover crops are basically plants that you grow in order to turn back into the soil eventually, or to to leave leave the the uh, sort of the biomass on top of the soil and use it as a mulch, okay? And it does incredible things for the soil. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years. Um, and had some had some nice experiments so there's a link there if you want to learn more about cover crops um again planting diverse crops in that little picture they got kale there's some nasturtium flowers there's all sorts of different things that will have wonderful benefits or if you can integrate animals i don't know maybe some of you have chickens um, although chickens do love to eat vegetables as well there are some nice ways to incorporate them um, to get the manure and some of the benefits uh, that they provide in the garden environment. So I think with that, that is all that I have for you. And I just want to wrap up by saying that, um, you know, I would love to continue to be or to be a, a resource, even if you don't work or live in South Jordan. Um, I think that this is an initiation for us to want to kind of widen our web and be a resource. So my contact in information is there and please feel free to reach out and talk garden with us and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you so much for coming. And I am, like I said, happy to stay up to about half an hour if people have individual questions, if you want me to go back, um, those types of things, and I'm happy to do it. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.